on Beth Avenue? Yeah. There used to be a baseball field there. Every field. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could have seen the Brooklyn Dodgers play there. This neighborhood has really changed a lot. I love it. There's no place like it. I might move to Central Brooklyn. Yeah? Why? I don't know. It's cute. What's cute about it? I don't know. It's cute. <laughs> like, Central Brooklyn's cute. Yeah, okay. I can work with that side. Work with it? I love that stuff. Do you like flatboats? There's no place like it. Graffiti train cars race blurry decorations through endless tunnels. Graffiti train cars careen past the stained glass art layered on white walls. Graffiti train cars deliver underground tours in subway museums. Graffiti train cars packed like subterranean auditoriums. Ebbets Field was on Bedford Avenue, within walking distance of where we lived in the projects. The projects were very, very different than they are now. The projects had landscaping. They got painted every spring. The benches outside were painted. Our apartments were painted. In those days, it was all lead paint. I remember I would have to go spend the night with grandparents on Macon Street when they painted in. Couldn't spend the night up there. Couldn't bring in the cubes. We didn't have a problem with each other based on race, but we used to go everywhere as a group. We would walk from Virgin Street and Buffalo Avenue all the way out to Brownsville, Betsy Head Swimming Pool. We'd go swimming with Betsy Head. We would walk all the way back home. When we were growing up, we would share everything. Soda, candy, in fact, if you bought something and somebody said eggs before you could say no eggs, you had to share it. <laughs> it was just the code of the street. You had to share it. And everybody did. You drank out of the same soda bottle. Nobody ever got sick. <laughs> We'd be out all day riding bicycles all over, going out to Prospect Park, and nobody ever got lost. Nobody ever got bruised. Nobody ever got kidnapped, you know? Nobody ever got jumped by a gang when we were little kids. But as we were growing older into like uh, our early teens, there were gangs. And there was a real gang culture. The heart of the gang activity in New York City was broke. There were gangs, like gangs called the Tiny Tim and the Pythons. I remember those. As we become a little older now in the early teens, now it's our turn to become the gangs. So it became the Corsairs. Vicious. The Chapman. John Quills. I don't know where that last name came from, but it was gang out of Ramsdale. The gang activity was not like it is now. In those days, maybe one person had a gun. And most often, it was what was called the zip gun. You know, they made from a cap pistol and something else, a shot class in school. You shoot the gun and the gun would like blow up in your head, you know? <laughs> so there wasn't that access to the weapon. Hardly anybody ever got shot. But they did get sad. Everybody had a knife. The gangs were large organizations of young people that later on, in the 60s, that the Panther Party transformed into political organizations. And uh, we always felt the gangs always represented a political potential, you know? And the gangs had a structure. Adults looking at these gangs would look at them and say, you know, we got a we better watch these kids. These kids are not good. I was a terrible kid. In school, I didn't pay attention. I didn't listen. I used to get in fights. I used to disturb the other students. I just didn't listen. I was sitting on my bed, writing in my diary, the only place where I could tell the truth, when my mom appeared in the doorway in my bedroom. I need one of you to go to the drugstore on the corner. I got letters to get in the mail and I ain't got no envelopes. Here's the money. You two decide who's going quickly on my show when time the drugstore closes. Okay. I just remember we beat some peroxide and band-aids. I used to laugh at those things on the paper cut that other day. Whoever's going, hurry up, I'm making dinner. I'm not going to the stuff. I'm not going either. I went to the store the last time. It's your turn. The last time you went to the store, we lived across town. We live in a new 
place now. So, that, yeah. I know we live in a new place. I don't need to be reminded. Brigitte, get up. It's your turn to go. You better get going before Mom comes back. I did hear the door open and close, so I know nobody left for the drugstore yet. If you two are fighting over who's going, you don't want me to come in there and settle it, do you? Brian said he was going to call me, and if I leave, I might miss him. Too bad. <laughs> if you go to the store, I'll let you wear my pico. I'll go. <laughs> Mine's going. I wanted to wear her pico. Everybody had one, and Jeep was brand new. She had gotten it for her birthday. I went to get mine for a couple of months. And she didn't know it, but I put it on while she was sleeping. I grabbed my new hat from his little shop around the corner from Abraham and Strauss in downtown Brooklyn that I discovered. You just go into the corner. Stop acting like you're going to a party or something. And don't mess up my cup. Graffiti train cars race blurry decorations through endless tunnels. Graffiti train cars careen past the stained glass art layered on white walls. Graffiti train cars deliver underground tours and subway museums. Graffiti train cars packed by subterranean auditoriums. 41 Kingston Avenue was my childhood home. I was born to a 13-year-old girl. My mother was pregnant by the age of 12. One of my earliest memories of living on Kingston Avenue was the whole window. It was always open from the bottom just a bit. My earliest memory of my mom is of her combing my hair by the hall window. I would sit between her legs as she brushed my hair. I remember turning and looking up at her, and I saw tears running down my mother's face. She said nothing, and neither did I. She simply nudged me back around and finished my hair. I don't remember any arguing or outstanding event that preceded that moment. I moved over here on Carroll Street between Bedford and Franklin, and I was looking out my window one morning, and I see these little boys. What are you doing up there, on the roof there? Don't you belong in school? You're not my mother. Ooh. So I went downstairs, and when they came off the roof, I started talking to those boys. I used to lie. I used to make paper airplanes. When the teacher would walk by, I'd pop her in the back of the head, and all the other kids would laugh out loud. I realized that they had an idea in their minds that they found something they couldn't find in school. They were playing hooky. <laughs> so that got me to thinking about it. There was a youth program called Hurricane Cadets. That was one of the big things in the 60s and 70s. I started to. From there, I got my own space at Evans Field. And then we got our own little storefront where Mega Evans is today. It was an abandoned building. We took it over and we made it over. In those days, there was so much abandonment in the community. That whole block was abandoned. From Bedford to Franklin, Crown to Montgomery, used to be a shopping mall there. And we took the old lumber from that old shopping mall and rebuilt it right where Medgar Evers is today. 1650 Bedford. How racist was it in Brooklyn back in the day? Oh, it was racist. But we didn't really notice it, you know? We had to normalize the political reality. So almost all the businesses were owned by white people. But the white people were not mean or hostile. It was a candy store on the corner of Burbank and Buffalo, where the Weasel Society is now known as Norma's Candy Store by the people who grew up there. Norma was like part of the community. Norma didn't live in the community, but a young woman in the projects got married, and her mother did not send an invitation to Norma to come to the wedding. Norma was irate. She was like, Why did I get that? I'm not married. Did you get an invitation? Are you going to so-and-so's wedding? Oh, then how come I'm not going? You know, she felt like she was a part of the community, and he felt like, yeah, no one ought to be there, you know? And she, like the other adults in the community, had dominion over me. If somebody saw me doing something, they could say, Bobby Law, get off that bench. Don't make so much noise. And if you really wanted to get in trouble, just say, you're not my mother. 
And if you really wanted to get knocked out before you get home, just talk back. <laughs> By the time you get home, my mother did tell Miss Cripps so she's not your mother. You know, all the adults looked out for us, and Norma was included in that. One day, we were coming out of the store, and they used to have these little ice cream trucks that go to the neighborhood, right? So the ice cream truck came around the corner, around on Buffalo Avenue. Buffalo Avenue was two way street back then. Just as we stepped out of the store, and one of the guys just said, Yo, 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 ice cream, ice cream! So the guy stopped. He got out of his little ice cream truck, came around the back, and opened the door. He said, Yes, what do you want? Ice cream. Please, sir, have you got the time? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh uh. Buy ice cream. But no. Uh, buy ice cream. Aw, man. I, just, I am one of the respected members of the community. Buy ice cream. As a matter of fact, all of you buy ice cream. Oh, come on. That's what she said, it, not me. Why did you stop? You stopped the ice cream truck. You buy the ice cream. Everybody did. She was one of the adults in the community. And it was that kind of community, you know? These kids are not good ones. This is broke. Our bright green, our bright blue ceiling, our bright blue ceiling is a canvas littered with specks of precipitation dripping on our grass green floor. This is broke. Sprouting life, death, and weeds like tears spring from our soul's windows until the foundation is a desert. This is broke. As we step into the solstice, my skin becomes the desert. The fire red sun heats the dark brown canvas and shines through the windows. How did you two guys meet? I met her on St. Mark's. I grew up on the same block. Standing in front of the building. I saw her eyes. I was always the shy one. It took me a while. And for a while, I was locked away. When I came back, I asked her out. We've been together ever since. She got pregnant. I had to leave all the bad stuff behind. I had to think what I was going to do. I ain't run off. We've been together ever since. When they came to this country from Panama in the late 1940s, they knew very little English. So together they would take English lessons at the girls' high school on No Street Avenue two evenings each week. That's nice. I was a child in the 1940s and 1950s, born and raised in Bedside. The first church that I attended and joined was St. Phillips, located on Madonna and Decatur Street. It was a short walk from my house on Lewis Avenue. At age 10, I joined the Girl Scouts. I remember when I marched with the Girl Scouts on the anniversary day parade. We were all decked out in green uniforms, and we knew we looked good. Oh, that's nice too. Who I am? It's where I come from, a giving mother, a loving father. There's no book on raising kids, but with grace and glory from God, I learned to be thankful. You allowed me to make mistakes, corrected me, gave me tools to be who I am in the world. A single black woman who raised two kids, two beautiful gifts. I let explore life. A scholarly daughter, a hardworking son, infatuated with learning, free to take their own steps and create their own Brooklyn stories. Really nice. Brooklyn stories? <laughs> all right, now. <laughs> I lived in Crown Heights all my life. <laughs> when you know, you know. We know. <laughs> my grandparents, growing up, education was everything. I remember being a senior in Erasmus Hall High School, located in the heart of Flatbush, Brooklyn. The year was 1956. The school population was 90% white, maybe 1% to 2% black. Teachers were Caucasian. At 16 or 17, I was a quiet, shy kid. My grades were mediocre, mostly B's, except in math, which I struggled with from term to term. My cumulative average was about 75%. I was unable to join the Arista High Honor Society because my average had to be 85%. Yet I always had the goal that I would graduate from high school, and then I'd go to Brooklyn College and become an educator. I was on track to graduate in June 1957. 
when my guidance counselor, Mr. Hochberg, asked me what, my, what I wanted to do after graduation. I plan to go to Brooklyn College and become an educator. How do you expect to get into college when you only have a 75% average? I always expected to go to college. My parents expect me to go to college. Hmm. I, I will work hard to fulfill my goal of becoming an educator. I doubt you'll get into college. You should think about taking some clerical courses so you can find a job. I left the office almost in tears. But let's fast forward to the year 1990. I was an experienced kindergarten teacher in District 16 in Brooklyn. After 24 years in the classroom, I obtained my MS degree in counseling and then became a guidance counselor. I tried to encourage all of my students to become the best they could be. I encouraged all my students to finish high school and college. These kids. I'm not hoodlums. We were working so hard with these youths, but sometimes I go to two, three funerals a day, you know? Young people, 25 senior citizens, you know? I lived in Crown Heights all my life. I used to hang out St. Mark's in Kingston, <laughs> Franklin between Dean and Pacific. I was a young kid, lived at Notion Ave, friends on Park Place. There wasn't really any restaurants, only Kingston Avenue. Jamaican, Chinese restaurants. I started seeing the street life. On Notion Avenue, I seen the dude lay out, head blown tall. I was about eight years old. Now, go, go back to Madison Street. As soon as school is over, the four of you together walk to Notion Avenue, then up to Clifton Place. We were moving into our new apartment. We were now between Notion and Beckford Avenues on a street with lots of children. Amos and Andy is on. Back in the 1940s, my mom felt that Amos and Andy was a show depicting black life in a very degrading way. Mom tried very hard to expose us to positive cultural images. And one day, while outside, a few of the children from the block surrounded a police cruiser which was parked in front of our building. Two white neighborhood policemen inside were telling these little black children jokes and stories. Well, up came scenes from one of the Amos and Andy shows, including stereotypical bundling, insults, and accents. Holy mackerel! I said holy mackerel! My younger brother decided to react. He took his finger and popped the cup to somebody that had so hard that it fell off onto his lap and down to the floor. My brother took off up the stairs, and me followed close behind him, this big, tall, white policeman a few steps behind me. I was screaming what happened to my mom. The police burst in red-faced, swearing and looking to kill this young boy of about seven years old. Damn it! Get back here, you little hoodlum! It was then I saw my mom on her knees, pleading, begging, crying, her arms wrapped around this very tall person's legs, trying to prevent him from going any further into the apartment. This image that remains some 70 or so years later in my mom's, on her knees, wrapping her arms around the knees of this powerful person who wanted to kill a little black boy because he flipped the hat off this person who was insulting black people. That image, my mom's, on her knees, pleading for the life and safety of her child, 75 years later continues to repeat itself. The needless killing and wounding of young black males and other people of color is still a major disease in this country. These kids are not hoodlums. No, they are not. In 1964, after a black 15-year-old boy was shot by a white police officer in Harlem. Riots broke out in Harlem and later spread to Brooklyn and Philadelphia. I lived on Kaliasco Street in Bedford Sidison and heard the horrible noises of breaking glass and gunshots. White flight began. While we were little kids, we didn't even know what was happening. There were a lot of atrocities committed in Brooklyn, you know? Do you remember Arthur Miller, who had the, the little grocery store on Nelson Avenue, and then he also had the building he wanted to renovate. He wanted to make a, a skating ring. I remember, yeah. They used to call me Miss Arthur. Miss Arthur? 
Miss Arthur! They have Arthur. They put him in the back of a police car and he, he doesn't look right. He was already dead. What did they tell you about what happened? Art had a blue pickup truck. His brother Joe was driving it. The police stopped Joe in the truck because he had a suspended license. Now how do they know his license was suspended, you know? Right? Okay, then they sent him back to get the owner of the truck, which was Art. Why? Why did they send him to get his brother? You, you know, if they really wanted to, why didn't they take him and the truck back to Nostrum Avenue? They had Arthur come towards Rogers Avenue. Now, Art had a permit for a gun. He used to wear on his side. He got the permit through the police department. He took shooting lessons through the police department. The police were always at our building lifting weights with him, doing everything, so they all knew he kept the gun. All of a sudden, the guy said he held up his hand. They saw the gun and the police panicked. Why would they panic? It was holster. They knew he had it. All hell broke loose. They drug him in the car. How many times have you heard this same story? Too many times. I think he was targeted. A lot of times when you have a black man who speaks his mind and backs it up, that makes a lot of people afraid. I think because he was a man of color, they wanted Arthur out of the way. Role models. I ain't really had none. Well, I had one, but he passed away. I remember the day when Medgar was killed. So we lost five great civil rights giants from 1963 until 1968. Medgar, Malcolm, JFK, we lost Malcolm, then Dr. King, and then Bobby Kennedy. So we lost five. Looking back at it, it was kind of like traumatic. And then we are now in the middle of Vietnam, you know? Going after one another was the only way, you know? I was trying to figure it out. Is there another way? And then I pick up the chair and I throw it at the teacher. And then I ask my mom, why you got so much anger here? And lunch detention. I didn't really care. School lunch was nasty anyway. Well, most of the time I'd end up just getting suspended. Randy Evans was a 14-year-old sitting just on the front stoop of his housing project in Brownsville when a cop came out of his building. The little boy said to the cop, are you coming from my house? And the cop pulled out his gun and shot him in front of all those people. The cop said that he suffered from some kind of epileptic motor. Just heard the news report. Another black man shot and killed by a police officer. Wait, they shoot him. Not the lady. Our hearts are still breaking. We are a people. We feel. We believe. We, we love. love. We long for the day when the times and the tears of, of when and the tears of why will dry. Right there. I, I, was I was there. 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 You can see the library. You can see the arch. You can see the entrance to Prospect Park. Prime real estate. <laughs> Talk to me about real estate. I can't even pay my apartment bills. <laughs> they raised my rent over two hundred dollars. I grew up between the seventy-first precinct, which is up on Empire, when I lived in this area. When we moved, when we moved out to Flatbush, it was a sixty-seven precinct, and I can always remember, you know, a fairly good working relationship with the cops. It was such that the cops, you know, were like the city's parents, you know? They parented me. I always remember Officer D'Amico. He was the truant officer, like the cops who handled people that played hooky. And he would know you by name. If he ran up on you, you'd try to run, he would say, oh no, I know who you are. Don't even bother. When I was 12 years old, my mother told me that anybody wearing a blue uniform is to be respected because they are our protectors. She also told me that if I should need help, I should seek out the blue uniform and they would help me. That was in 1949 when we came to this country. As a precocious child, I had to test my mother's directive. <laughs> so one day, not being lost, but not quite so close to home, 
I went up to the white man in the blue uniform and I told him I had lost my car there. Could he help me get home? He asked me where home was and I told him Brooklyn. Brooklyn? You are in Brooklyn. Where's your home in Brooklyn? 32 Dewey Place. Do you know how to find your home? Yes, sir. I take the A train all the way to Rock Avenue. He walked to the train station and told me to wait while he talked to the man in the booth. When he came back, he walked to the gate, walked me to the gate by the turnstile, opened it, and sent me on my way. I couldn't tell my mother what I had done. I couldn't tell her that I had lied to the policeman, the white man in the blue uniform. I told her that I know some part of my anatomy would born the grunt of my mother's anger. But I had to prove to myself that the blue uniform could be trusted. It's not that I didn't believe my mother. It's just strange to hear that police were people who would help. Graffiti train cars race blurry decorations through endless tunnels. Graffiti train cars careen past the stained glass art layered on white walls. Graffiti train cars give underground tours in subway museums. Graffiti train cars pack like subterranean auditoriums. Franklin Avenue, one time they said it was the highest infestation of crack cocaine in the country. Not in the city, in the country. Still, we had victories. We've had many victories. What about the protests in front of Down State Hospital? Yeah, okay, but what about the Peace Jones? <laughs> and the silo chance of choir. I love that choir. <laughs> I remember 1962. They were building Down State Hospital on New York Avenue. That was the first time I ever heard of people laying down in front of bulldozers. They were trying to get more blacks to be hired on the building site. I lived near Beverly, near No Strands. Malcolm X was special then. And then Dr. King had his part to play. And Shirley Chisholm come along right here in this neighborhood. As a matter of fact, we have this street right here named for her. Park Place at Kingston is named Shirley Chisholm. We set up what we call peace zones. We had one over on Albany and Union in the city community. The city people gave us a lot that they had there. We did murals, painted up the abandoned buildings. Whenever we found an incident took place, we set up a peace zone there. We saw an area that was active in shooting. One of our ball players was shot on St. John's off Utica, and we set up a peace zone, an abandoned building right on that corner. We painted a mural. We found a way to put up these basketball hoops, or if we couldn't put them up, we'd get, uh, get the portables, put them out there. we put up a chess table, and those guys played dominoes. Those were the peace zones. After graduation from high school, I started attending the worship service on Sunday at South Lone Church. I remember the chance of choir being awesome. But the best part of service for me was Reverend Gallison's message. I can remember the days of struggling to wake up on Sunday after partying Saturday night. <laughs> but no matter how tired I was, I always made it, uh, I always made it Sunday morning. I was so inspired that in March of 1954, I was baptized and I joined a large, prestigious church located in Bedside. My older sister, she followed soon after me. I had lived in Brooklyn most of my life, and since late teenage years, I became aware of the color line that existed within a lot of organizations, such as Jack and Jill, The Lynx, Brooklyn Girlfriend, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, to name a few. All of the females were white skin and certainly could pass a brown paper bag test. You had to pass the color line to belong. I did not sense the same thing when I became a member of Silent. I, I never felt 
felt discriminated against because of my color. I remember when Chance Choir sang the cute version of We Are the World. Yes! yes. We are the world. We are the children. We are the ones that make a brighter day. So let's start giving. Silent <laughs> Chance Choir supported what I learned and saw at home. It gave me a weapon against the, the constant assault of slander and racism that black men and boys enjoy. So, when the assaults would start, the first thing that would come to my mind when somebody was talking was, who are you talking about? But you see, I had the opportunity to observe black men as, as people who were enriched, mm. devoted. They had love in their lives. They were kind and fun loving. Some people would have you believe that those are not the qualities of black men. From the hospitable sweet tea of the South to the year-long sunny waves of the West, both worked to abandon life from hand to mouth. A respected officer, now a healthcare worker and his spouse, an educator just doing their best from the hospitable sweet tea in the South. They left behind colors of tribulation and got out. Tuskegee graduates never said what next. Both worked to abandon life from hand to mouth. Reunions of old faces smile and shout no one treated as a guest from the hospitable sweet tea in the south. Though troubling times, love still prevails within their house, helping others with this mindset. Both work to abandon life from hand to mouth. Living unfortunate history, today they keep vows, knowledge to break bread from the hospitable sweet tea in the south. Both work to abandon life from hand to mouth. Ah! Yes? Did did I tell you? Tell me what? I love you. Oh, get on out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Graffiti trade crops raise blurry decorations during the summers. Didn't you live in Crown Heights? Oh, my favorite place. <laughs> Graffiti train cars screen past the stained glass heart laid on white walls. We used to hang out, St. Mark's and Kingston, Franklin between Dean and Pacific. Graffiti train cars to live underground tours and subway museums. I was a young kid, lived at Nostrand Ave, friends on Park Place. Graffiti train cars parked like subterranean auditoriums. Now there are fewer faces pressed against the least window. There's this building on Butler, 55 Butler Place. Beautiful building that is now a condominium. Have you been to the tower shop over there? No, which one? I live on Kaliosko Street in Beckford Stuyvesant. I remember when that was done. I'm learning something. I'm asking for more. Live today. Though troubling times, love still prevails. Just as the sun rises in the east, sets in the west every day. Childhood rage from the running. Later, a man in Crown Heights with colored paintbrushes, diverse like my neighborhood, wiping Ezekiel loaves, red curry filled sauces, and pale gentrification. I construct the art of beings that know the trap. Brody pastors, brown faces, foreign individuals can be seen on portraits, illustrating the voyage of their art. Graffiti, train dogs. Littered with mass passengers. Dispersing Lysol. Dispersing. 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 We're all here now. We're here in Brooklyn. We've been here. We're here now. We'll be here. I was about seven. We practiced. That's nice. You got on stage. You danced. That's nice too. <laughs> Round of applause.
make something like this happen. Amina Henry, our playwright. Thank you all for being here.